Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Sean Willems. Um, this is a joint work with Salal Humair, John Ruark, who will also be giving part of the talk today, and Brian Tomlin. And what we're here to talk about is incorporating stochastic lead times into the guaranteed service model of safety stock optimization. But before we sort of get into the math, I just want to level set everyone with a quote. And this work is that John and I have been doing for, for over a decade. We started this, we, we built an inventory optimization company, and it was, as you can expect in this sort of endeavor, there's lots of difficult research that gets added into software over time. And some of these things, you know, we're incredibly proud of, you know, they incredibly difficult features that take person years of time, you know. And, and so one of these features was a feature on how to model more complex networks. And it wasn't fully complex networks, it was just more complex networks. And this work was, we finished this work in about 2004. Uh, the, the paper, the ultimate paper got accepted into operations research. So here we are sort of very proud of this work. It's, it's uh, gotten into sort of our top journal. We're applying it in practice. Everything's really good. And we are at our lead customer. And we're sitting down. It's the launch day for this version of the software. So we're sitting down. I'm sitting at the cafeteria with uh, one of the people from the team. And I'm just, uh, you know, to this person, I'm just the vendor, right? I mean, I don't know who this person is. This person doesn't know who I am. I'm just the vendor, you know. Uh, and, and she turns to me and says, you know, if we have to take the final result from your software and multiply it by a fudge factor, we won't use it. Because we could just save ourselves the time and effort by winging it right from the start. You can picture the gears slowly moving in my head as this is happening. Have we really fully solved it? Well, actually, we hadn't by at that point. Um, we probably still haven't. Uh, are they just going to wing it? Uh, so, so what we left from that meeting was this realization that truly and completely solving the problem is our mission. So when we're looking at inventory optimization problems, we have to truly and completely solve the problem. So what does that actually mean, right? What does it mean to truly and completely solve something? And so what it means is that the answer that we produce has to be the answer that feeds the company's execution system, right? It can't be that they take this result and then do something else to it outside of the software and then put it in, right? So we've got to take the result, feed it in directly. It also means that we have to account for all the major factors that the planner has to account for when they're setting their safety stock levels. So we can't skip anything major that they need. And then finally, our answer needs to be, our process and solution approach needs to be understandable to the smart planners on that team. That's not saying they need to understand the math. This could be sort of a, a topic of its own session. But it's that they understand the process. They understand what data was required to get in, how that data had to be processed, what solution got produced by the model, and then what ultimately got entered back into the software. So they understand this beginning to end process. The really smart planners, so as opposed to just the smart planners, the really smart planners, they need to understand the math. They want to understand the math. But the group here to get widespread adoption we need them to understand the overall process. So that's what we've internalized, and that's what we're going to share today. So what we're going to cover, we're going to talk about variability. Then we're going to talk about the guaranteed service model, give an overview of it. Talk about the enhancement for stochastic lead times. Give a couple examples, and then conclude. So if we start with an example of variability, this is an eight-stage supply chain. So this supply chain is modeled at the SKU location level. So it's a particular item at a particular location, right? This is the level of detail at which a planner has to stock inventory, right? They stock inventory by level, by location, right, by item. So this is at the most detailed level in a bill of materials. And here we have numerous sources of variability that can crop up even in this simple supply chain. For sourcing, for the sourcing of the parts, you know, for overseas suppliers, we typically have lead time structures that are, say, 30 days, 70% of the time, 
60 days, 20% of the time. And when it's not 30 or 60 days, we have sort of enormous problems, and it's like 180 days the remainder of the time. So when we look at raw material on the supply side, it is typically very discreet and very lumpy. And this corresponds to, you know, normally it's going to make the boat, and it'll be normally be 30 days. Sometimes it misses the boat. Sometimes our supplier lied to us and told us it was going to be on the boat. It wasn't on the boat. It didn't come on the second boat. And now there's a cold start restart to get the item, so it takes 180 days, right? So at this point, the product is at its cheapest point, and, but it's still we have to account for these very long potential lead times. In the middle of the process where we're manufacturing or assembling something, to be honest, this is actually the most straightforward variability in the system. This lead time is typically due to schedule adherence or sort of what I call sort of simple queuing effects. But this is also the lead time we tend to sort of understand the best in the system. So saying something like it takes seven days, you know, normally distributed at seven days with a, with a standard deviation of three days, you know, that would be sort of a typical uh, lead time variability in sort of this manufacturing part of the operation. We also often have the best data on this part of the, of the variability in the supply chain because we control this portion the best. Either our supplier, our contract manufacturers, or, or ourselves, our, our uh, own manufacturing operation. When we think about the distribution portion of the supply chain, you know, here is actually where there's, in effect, very little volatility, but it has a very big impact. So here, you know, typical times might be, that it takes two days 95% of the time. You know, maybe it takes a day 1% of the time. That might not even be worth sort of actually modeling, other than the fact that, you know, if you see like the iPhone 5 launch or something, and, you know, if people are so excited because they got there, it was like a day early, even though it should have been shipped, you know, sort of delivered the day later because the hold wasn't put on it properly. Uh, and if it sort of doesn't get there in two days, it gets there in three days. And it gets there in three days, you know, 4% of the time. But this 4% of the time, even though it's very small, has a very big impact. Why does it have such a big impact? Well, it has such a big impact because the product is at its most expensive point, right? So at this point, we've got the most expensive item. Also, if we're talking about a day of lead time at our customer, you know, at their DC, what we're really worried about here is sort of the covering of this extra day's worth of the mean demand. So there's a big storage constraint issue, right? That if we're late, and then they need to buffer more for that inventory. This is at its most expensive spot where space is at its most precious. So here we have a problem that's somewhat different, sort of the flip of the supplier side, where there we've got very, lead very long lead times, but the item's cheap. Here we have very short lead times with some variability, but the item's very expensive. So if we have lead time variability, we dramatically increase the need for safety stock. And this is why planners hold, certainly one of the dominant reasons, why planners hold more inventory than, say, what a theoretical model with, with, with discrete uh, deterministic lead times would require. Because here we see that as, as, a, as lead time variability increases, sort of as a function of its COV coefficient of variation, then we're dramatically increasing uh, safety stock requirements. So it's not, it's not at all surprising for safety stock requirements to be increased by 50% due to lead time variability, right? So lead time variability has a really tremendous impact on safety stock. Now, how we tackle this problem is with something known as the, the guaranteed service model of inventory optimization. The guaranteed service model dates back to the 50s with, uh, with Kenneth Simpson and George Kimball uh, in work that appeared in Operations Research. And it looks at, it looks at every, mo every supply chain as a series of stages. The stages, not surprisingly like before, are SKU locations. So they are a location that is a candidate to hold inventory. And the main dynamic that drives inventory requirements in this supply chain is net replenishment time. So net replenishment time that we denote here with tau is the amount of time that a stage is responsible for holding inventory. It's the amount of time that it's responsible for covering. And 
this is a function of the largest sort of delivery time quoted to you by your suppliers plus your own production time minus the delivery time that you quote your customers. Okay, so it very much takes into account not only your specific lead time to do something, but the time to get your longest lead time item as well as the delivery time that you quote your customers. And so we can see that in this simple five-stage supply chain. So this five-stage supply chain where stage one feeds two, feeds three, feeds four, feeds five. So in this network, there's lots of different ways that we could allocate the net replenishment times such that we still had the same delivery to the final customer, that stage five still had the final delivery to its customer, but we held inventory in different manners internally. So for example, this would be the sprinkle it everywhere strategy, what's up here now. Every stage covers its own lead time, so the net replenishment at every stage equals its lead time. Every stage, quote, zero service times. So it's like decoupled from everywhere else in the supply chain. We could take that same model, create a different policy, what I like to call the get me fired strategy. This strategy is the product at its most expensive, most differentiated. That's where we hold inventory. That covers all of the lead time in the supply chain. Everyone else has a net replenishment time of zero. They have a, they push in effect their lead time to the next person. Ultimately, we can't push, the final customer won't wait for it forever, so that's where inventory gets held. This might be the optimal inventory strategy, where stage two holds a net replenishment time that covers the lead times of both stage one and stage two, and stage five covers stage three, four, and five. So this is sort of a different example of ways that three different inventory policies in this supply chain uh, all still produce the same result to the final customer, but they have different net replenishment times internally. And so the very nice part about the, the guaranteed service model is that it works with the physics of time, right? It just shows its, its main benefit of how stages interact with one another is through time, and planners can understand that quite readily. If we think about the inventory requirements, well, it turns out that the inventory requirements are a very nice function of net replenishment time. So depending on uh, the level of sophistication you want to employ, you can model very rich functions of net replenishment time, and we'll show a few examples of it later. But as a general statement, in the simplest version of the model, the expected inventory level is just some function of the maximum demand over the net replenishment time minus the expected demand over the net replenishment time. So we've linked all of these stages together through net replenishment time. There's a simple inventory function that tells us how much inventory is required as a function of that net replenishment time. So in that way, it's sort of a very nice, simple model. I like to think of this model as the gift that keeps giving, just as a quick aside, because it's sort of nice and compact and understandable. Um, if we put it in a math programming framework, what we have is sort of we minimize the sum over all the stages, their inventory holding cost, which is a function of these decision variables, which are the S and the SIs, the incoming service time and the outgoing service time, which dictates then the net replenishment time. So it dictates that cost function, subject to the fact that net replenishment times have to be non-negative, that the incoming service time at a stage has to be greater than or equal to all the service times that are quoted to that stage, plus any limitations we set on service time due to say that we don't let stages hold a certain amount of inventory, uh, plus sort of non-negativity constraints. So what we have is a compact nonlinear integer programming formulation for, uh, for this problem. And if we think about what makes this problem hard, I don't know, maybe you look at that problem and think it looks easy. I think it looks okay. What makes it hard, at that level it all looks okay, right? So if we sort of look at well, what, makes actually, what makes the problem underlying problem hard, well, the first is demand propagation. So how demand transmits between different stages in the supply chain, right? How these CI functions get populated. Then also service time optimization, how optimizing the, the, the net replenishment time at one stage impacts the other stages, and cost propagation, right? So how the cost accrues across the supply chain. 
So we've done a fair amount of work in this area. And, and so I'd say our work sort of falls into two major buckets. One is extending the theory of this model. So ourselves or some other co-authors have, have looked at optimizing this to more general, uh, industry, uh, more general network structures into, to handle non-stationary demand and review periods. So instead of more methodological, uh, uh sort of theory-driven improvements, as well as, uh, practice, you know, how do companies really implement these models? So what are the kinds of processes that they have to change? And how do they integrate it into their processes? And with that, I'll now hand over to John to talk about stochastic lead times more specifically. Thank you, Sean. So what we wanted to talk about in terms of where our contributions are with respect to uh, adding stochastic lead times to the general service model is really in two different domains. One is on the methodological side where the introduction of stochastic lead times has caused us to refine our definition of the types of stock that we'll be holding at these item locations. Uh, and part of that is the introduction of a new type of stock that we'll discuss in a moment. But also now, as a result of that, we have cost functions that become non-concave and in some cases non-differentiable. And so now we have to be able to modify the optimization algorithms to handle this new complexity. Uh, on the practical side, the end result has been that customers who've been using the product that Sean and I have created, along with help from many others, is that our customers have been able to tactically deploy the solution in a repeatable way at scale. So they've been able to throw in stochastic lead times into the analysis and continue to get tactical results that they can deploy without really having to dive in there and, and, and make, make many changes by hand. So we'll talk about the methodological side first. Uh, common models for characterizing safety stock, and many of those that include variable uh, lead times to date, uh, usually assume a zero-quoted service time, so the case where the stages are decoupled within a network. Uh, but in our case, where we have non-zero service times that we have to worry about, it's possible that replenishments can arrive earlier than they're expected. So a stage will get, an item location will receive stock uh, before it's due to, and now it's got the stock that it was not expecting. So on the one hand, we refine our definition of what safety stock is to only include the replenishments that occur after the promise dates. And the safety stock equation here will, will look very familiar uh, because it's, it's essentially the same structure as a normal safety stock equation, but instead of having the mean and variance of the net replenishment lead time, uh, we have these Q and R functions, which are essentially the mean and variance of the net replenishment lead time, but now being conditioned upon that net replenishment lead time being greater than zero. So it's really the effect of the, the positive events when the goods are arriving after the promise date, or at or after. Uh, but now to account for that portion where they're coming before, we introduce what we call early arrival stock. And this is that new type of safety stock that we add in. It's a new cause of, of holding inventory. And, and the equation is shown here, and you see it's largely uh, one of the key factors here is, is, is in the mean of demand. And then we also still have the impact of, of the, this, this net replenishment lead time. So here's a stylized picture of, of what happens when we have this variable lead time, which then results in a, a stochastic net replenishment lead time. So on the one hand, we have random demand coming in, you know, traditionally normal shaped. Uh, then we have a lead time, which may be normal, but it may be, as, as Sean mentioned, it may be discrete because we have some cases where we're modeling this by modal behavior of sometimes we get the inventory at an expected time, but sometimes everything goes haywire, and it's going to be a very long time until we get the goods that have been ordered. When you put those two together, you basically have early arrival stock that's accounting for the time that we receive goods before we thought because the goods were shipped to us much quicker than we thought. But then when that net replenishment lead time gets to zero, safety stock takes over. Safety stock's driven largely by that variability of demand, and the early arrival stock on the left is driven largely by that the mean. And we'll see specific examples of this here. So when we talk about the optimization now, now that we've incorporated this new definition of early arrival stock, we now have the problem that these cost functions may be non-concave and non-differentiable. So here are two examples of how early arrival stock and safety stock play together, taken from some of the real-world models that we have. On the left, we have a stage 
where the lead time is essentially, I think, modeled as, as normal. And so while the curve is smooth, uh, the, the, the costs that we're optimizing here are, are, are no longer concave. On the right, we have a lead time that was discrete, and that has caused some choppiness in the equation. So our contribution in this arena was we, we extended the algorithms that we had to now account for the fact that we have these, these more complex cost functions. And in many cases, we have more generalized network structures, as, as Sean mentioned early on as well. So as a result of this and, and, and getting this out into a product, we've had the good fortune for many manufacturing companies to use the solution uh, and especially to use the stochastic lead time capabilities within the software uh, to, to better model both tactically and strategically, as we'll talk about in a second, uh, their safety stocks within their, within their supply chains. So the benefits from this really come in two different levels of the planning process. Uh, on the one hand, we're helping companies to better optimize inventory levels as part of their ongoing planning process. And this really is the tactical optimization of their inventory levels. You know, we're able to, without much manual intervention, and in many cases no manual intervention by end users, we're raising inventory levels in some cases, reducing them in others. And a priori, customers will never know which of those should have been higher, which should have been lower. And we're taking into account all of these additional complexities we've been layering in over time. You know, many of the things that, that Sean showed in that list of, of, of papers that have been worked on. So tactically speaking, we are getting repeatable processes. Their customers are running this, these models every week or every month. And for the most part, they're, they're hands off. So customers are able to trust the answers that they're getting and they, they, they don't need much if any intervention. The second big benefit is more on the strategic side. So we're now able to quantify the benefits of some analyses that, that customers simply couldn't do before. And not only that, but they get a lot of the, these analyses essentially for free because they've already got the data in the tactical models and now they can abstract that tactical layer up to a strategic layer. And now they can start to analyze some problems such as how and whether to implement postponement, reallocating consignment inventories, in many cases, reconciling inventory practices across geographies, which is related, and making channel inventory more revenue producing. So they're really looking at some of these strategic types of problems, figuring out what the right position of inventory in the network is, taking into account the fact that they have some of these variable lead time problems. And then ideally, in some cases, we're starting to see them push these strategic solutions back down to the tactical level. So they actually remodel and, and rebuild the tactical solution to take into account the strategic decisions that they're making. So now we'll look at a couple of examples quickly. We, we, we're taking our examples, two of them in this case, from a set of real-world models uh, that Sean collected from many of our customers over the years. We have a, a, a library of 38 supply chain models that, that we gathered from planners, and these are representative of their real models. We asked them basically for, for their canonical models of their business. And interestingly, 26 of those models had variable stage times enabled. So that was a good data point for us to see how widely this was being used as we started this study. For these two models that, that we've, we're, we're showing here, we're going to be comparing the stochastic lead time approach that we've developed in this model with two heuristics. One is to fix every stage that has variable stage times to have a lead time equal to its average value. So a relatively traditional approach of just using the mean. The other is a more conserv conservative approach of setting its lead time to be its maximum lead time, which is obviously in a discrete case. In, in a more variable case, we might take it to be you know, two standard deviations above the mean, something like that. So chain one here, this I believe is the same chain we were showing earlier, a uh, th three echelon chain. Interestingly, of the eight stages here, only one stage had variable stage times enabled. I'm sorry, I, I say variable stage times because that's what we call in the software, so stochastic lead times. Uh, only one stage had a variable lead time. This was the most critical component of this network, and so the planner wanted to really analyze the impact of variability on this component on the rest of the supply chain. And what we found is that this variability really highlights the impact of the lead time uh, on safety stock itself. So as we can see in the table below, the fixed mean and fixed max strategies grossly underestimated the amount of safety stock required by an order of magnitude. 
once we introduced the variable lead time, the safety stock jumped up from three to 400 to over 7,000. This is because this part has a lead time that is almost twice its mean. So there's one discrete component of lead time that has about, I think, a 20% chance of occurring, but it's about twice the mean. So it's, it's a very long lead time. And these, the lead times are high compared to the rest of the lead times in the chain. In the end, the stochastic approach uh, models lead time that's close to the max, but still less than, than, than the max. And we can see that the, the heuristics that we had are under and overestimating the total inventory investment required, which is a combination of the pipeline, safety, and early arrival stock by 18% and 4% in this model. The second chain we're looking at here, chain number 12 from that pool of 38 chains, a much more complex chain. Uh, We've got a set of it here that has 88 stages and 107 arcs, so it's a complex general network. It's no longer spanning tree. It's not a, it's not a simple fan-in or fan-out model. 16 of these stages had normally distributed lead times. 12 of them had discrete uh, lead times. And while the stocks are much closer between the mean, the stochastic, and the max, uh, one of the key learnings from this was that if we didn't have variable stage times, then only 75 stages were required to hold safety stock. But as soon as we turned on the variable stage times, 80 of the possible stocking locations were stocking safety stock. So it actually changes the positioning strategy required. And that can have a pretty significant impact on the tactical process. From the practical perspective, uh, what we've seen is that few companies have lead time stored in their centralized ERP systems in any easy to get way. So they might have some of it stored in a data warehouse. They have it stored in different fields. They have it stored in uh, tables that weren't the regular tables to be storing it in. So the end result is planners, when they're putting lead time into planning systems for inventory purposes and other purposes, they're often just using rules of thumb. They're saying, well, we're not going to have variable lead times, or we're just going to use 10% everywhere. Or they're using tools like Excel, which is not particularly scalable. So we need to calculate lead time distributions from transactional data. And our, our practical contribution here was that we had to overcome a bunch of implementation challenges with respect to this. One of the big ones is the fact that uh, if you have infrequent shipments, so if you have intermittent demand, you're not going to have a lot of data points for getting a good statistic around lead time. And in that case, uh, you need to figure out how do you bucket SKU level items up into product family in order to get the benefit of particular events at the SKU level, but you can, you know, events that are occurring at one SKU maybe should have an impact on the entire product family, but that's lost if you're just calculating lead time for each individual SKU. So rolling these up into product family and then being able to disaggregate it back down to each individual SKU once you have the statistics is one of the things that we implemented. And then the other is more of a business process question, but that is how often should you be updating your lead times within a system? So we, we've already addressed uh, through earlier efforts, how often should you be updating safety stocks? And so your safety, your target optimal safety stock level maybe should change every week, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to put that back into a planning system. The same is true of lead time variability. So we've implemented a system to obtain the lead time distribution from transactional data, roll it up as needed, and then use that roll up to be able to plug into the planning systems for both tactical and strategic safety stock calculations. Uh, so to conclude, we've extended the guaranteed service model for safety stock optimization to accommodate stochastic lead times. We have the real practical contribution of being able to automate this process in a repeatable and scalable way so that companies can really deploy this. And methodological contribution uh, in, includes the fact that, that we've modified our refinement of how we calculate the different types of inventory, including the introduction of early arrival stock, and we've been delighted to see that this turns out to be probably the most advanced, most used advanced functionality of the guaranteed service model inventory tools that we have, uh, in part because it's one of the easiest to use. You know, if, if, if you can get that transactional data out of there, then presto, we can start using it. Uh, but also because it allows us to perhaps most closely match the real world constraints that we're dealing with, uh, with within the companies that are deploying the solution. Thank you.